Rutgers along the sideline. Another run. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rodgers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. Oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going to go out of there. The band have won. The band have won. The Pac-12 has long been one of college sports' strongest conferences, highlighted under the California sunshine and Cascadian rains. From UCLA's 10 national titles between 1964 and 1975, to Oregon rising to become one of the new millennium's most prominent football programs, the Pac-12's history is one full of athletic successes, strengthened by the academic pursuits of the students that make up the 12 colleges that call the conference home. But recently, it appears as though the conference is teetering on disaster. The exits of two conference pillars, the Los Angeles schools, to the Big Ten has left the conference in a situation not unlike the Big 12s, adapt or die. Weakened by former Commissioner Larry Scott in a series of unfortunate mistakes, many expect the Pac-12 to weaken from the power it has held for years and years. Some theorize its mountain schools may leave for the Big 12, while others believe Oregon and Washington, as well as some potential California schools, will leave for the Big Ten, like USC and UCLA. But regardless of its future, the history of the conference is one full of twists and turns, and may very well be the most interesting history out of any of the so-called Power Five. Let's take a look into that history, and see what made the Pac-12 the western beacon of athletics it has been for over a hundred years. Of course, any conference history isn't complete without the history of the institutions that created it. California entered the Union as a free state in 1850, earlier than much of the central United States, and its flagship institution, Cal Berkeley, was established as a land-grade institution in 1868. The state of Oregon, flushed with settlers following the Oregon Trail, was established as a state in 1859, with its land-grade institution, Oregon Agricultural College, which is now Oregon State, being decreed in 1868. Washington, to its north, formed in 1889, with land-grant Washington State College forming a year later. For years, these schools collaborated academically, but did not officially collaborate athletically until 1915. Much of the United States' colleges had athletic teams by this point, these universities and more were no different. Needing an agreement to ease the stress of scheduling, members of the universities of Cal and Oregon Ag joined forces in a Portland Hotel Conference Center with the University of Oregon, established in 1876, and the University of Washington, 1861, to create the four-team Pacific Coast Conference in 1915. Two years later, Washington State agreed to become the fifth team to join the conference, and a year after that, Stanford became the sixth. The conference did not stay at six for very long. Though. One of the most prestigious and fastest growing colleges in the country was Southern California, Los Angeles, established in 1880. With an athletics program beginning to come into its own during the Roaring Twenties, the Trojans joined the conference in 1922. Expansion into the Rocky Mountains was done during the same year as, oddly enough, the conference added the University of Idaho as its eighth member. The PCC continued with this eastward expansion in 1924 with the addition of the University of Montana and rounded out the conference of 10 teams with UCLA in 1928. Idaho and Montana were Pac-12 members before UCLA was. In fact, UCLA's nickname of the Bruins, which is one of the more unique in college sports, is a direct byproduct of this. UCLA's athletics teams had been known as the Grizzlies prior to their entry into the PCC, but since Montana had already been a member of the conference and were named the Grizzlies, the students at UCLA felt the need to differentiate, so they chose the Bruins instead. Modern day FBS UCLA had to change their name because of FCS Montana. The Rose Bowl game has been held since 1902, or 1916 depending on who you ask, and has almost always featured a team from the PCC and its constituents, played in the Los Angeles Stadium of the same name, except for when it wasn't. Known as the granddaddy of them all, it's widely considered to be one of the most influential postseason football games of all time. It's still played today, commonly between a team from the Pac-12 and the Big Ten, a nod to its East vs. West All-Star game past. Interestingly enough, the PCC may have been one of the earliest athletic conferences to institute some kind of division structure, as some sports, like baseball and basketball, split the 10-team league into a four-team California branch and a six-team Pacific Northwest branch as a sort of miniature scheduling agreement within the existing conference. 
Some websites, like Wikipedia, note that St. Mary's University was a conference member for baseball during an uncertain time frame that extends from at least 1927 to 1941, as they are listed as conference champions a handful of times during that period. Other temporary members of this division, which lasted into the 60s, include Santa Clara, Loyola Marymount, Occidental, Pepperdine, UC Santa Barbara, San Francisco, and Whittier College. Despite these titans of the early athletic world, the PCC was anything but stable. Member institutions bickered constantly over educational and financial decisions, as conference membership was not limited to just athletics. This schism was mostly felt between the Northwestern and California schools. Some sources even list a prominent figure in this North versus South rivalry, Cal Regent Edwin Pauley, who even went so far as to advocate for splitting the conference in two so the California schools could have their own conference. Some educational and financial decisions leaked into athletics and eventually led to the first of major crises for the conference. Many schools had been athletically reprimanded for allowing students under their teams with quote-unquote subpar academics. One of its commissioners, Edwin N. Atherton, was a former FBI agent that had worked on investigating a scandal at some of the schools. That's how prominent scandals were. USC was suspended in 1924 for failing to reach standards, and in 1951, Oregon head football coach Jim Aiken was revealed to have overseen illegal financial aid and other monetary boons to the program. The investigation into this created a chain reaction of scandals being discovered at UCLA and Washington, which sparked the flames that would kill the PCC. Montana decided to leave the conference for the Mountain States Conference in 1950, replacing Colorado, who had just left for the Big Seven before much of the fires started. Side note, the commissioner of the Mountain States Conference at the time was a man by the name of Dick Romney, who was the father of Milton Romney, the NFL player, who was the cousin of former Governor George Romney, who was the father of former presidential candidate and current Utah Senator Mitt Romney. Crazy. In 1956, Washington football players, upon discovering the unequal payments that had been made to them by coach John Cherberg, rallied to relieve Cherberg of his post. Sanctions came down on this program as well, becoming the third in five years. UCLA booster clubs were discovered to have been making payments to players that same year. The university refused to collaborate with investigations until it was too late to pretend that there was no truth to the scandals. Another slush fund was discovered at USC, and then at Cal Berkeley. With the conference on fire and the PCC name thoroughly sullied, the member institutions agreed to disband the conference in 1958. Even this was not done without other members thumbing their noses. The presidents of Oregon State, one of the few institutions without a major scandal, slammed Cal and UCLA's marriage that created the conference as an illegitimate child that has the bard of a purebred but the innards and the hair of a mongrel. The conference propping itself up while being held together by scotch tape would become a running theme. When the smoke cleared, the PCC was no more. A new conference stood in its place, the Athletic Association of Western Universities, consisting of the two Los Angeles schools, Cal and Washington. They entered discussions with regents from Stanford about creating an even more unique conference, nicknamed the Airplane Conference, that would likely have been the country's first super conference. This proposed super conference would have featured early powers like the military academies, Pitt and Penn State, Syracuse, and even Notre Dame. But a last minute interjection from a member of the Pentagon killed the idea late in the development. Stuck with remaining regional, the conference reinvited Wazoo in 1962, and both Oregon schools rejoined a couple years after that. Montana and Idaho were not reinvited. When the AAWU had consisted of six teams, they were referred to colloquially as the Big Six, a nickname shared by the Missouri Valley Intercollegiate Athletics Association in Middle America. So when the two Oregon schools were added and membership rose back up to eight, the conference needed a name different from the Big Eight. They chose the Pacific Eight instead, a nickname reminiscent of their standing as colleges from the three states bordering the Pacific Ocean, and renamed themselves officially to the Pacific Athletic Conference. The Pac-8 competed for over a decade as they were, from 1964 to 1978. National championships often came in streaks, like USC's firm grasp on all the Pac's football championships during this time. The most dominant of these streaks belonged to UCLA, who took a total of 10 national championships in just over 10 years under head coach John Wooden. During this time frame, USC also saw success in baseball, while they, Oregon, and UCLA saw success in track. Title IX did not go into effect for many sports until 1982. Expansion, as it was for most major conferences in the late 70s, was inevitable. There were rumors on and off about possibly adding BYU, but those deals never came through. With nowhere else to go but East, the Pac-8 became the Pac-10 by inviting both Arizona and Arizona State from the Western Athletic Conference in 1976. The Wildcats and Sun Devils became full members two years later, 
and in doing so became the first members of the conference situated in the mountain time zone since Montana left in 1950. They stayed the Pac-10 for over 30 years. During this time frame, the conference won a handful of national championships, including in football, Washington's 1991 national championship is disputed, both men's and women's basketball, outdoor track, baseball, wrestling, and a whole host of softball championships. Pac-10 football is a hit on Prime Sports Northwest. Our live Pac-10 game of the week means you get more Pac-10 on PSN than anywhere else. Your teams and our coverage make you the winner with Prime Sports Northwest. Pac-10 football on Prime Sports Northwest. 2009 brought the entrance of a new commissioner to the conference. Larry Scott, formerly the CEO of the Women's Tennis Association, who instantly got to work on formulating a new television agreement with ESPN and Fox Sports. But that was not the only development Scott had intended on bringing to the conference. In 2010, Colorado announced that it was leaving the Big 12 to join the Pac-12, as shaky ground within the Central Most Power 5 conference began to give way. The Buffs were the first to have announced and accepted, but they were hardly the only Big 12 schools that planned on ditching the Big 12 for the Pac. In fact, before the Pac-10 became the Pac-12, they were almost the Pac-16. High-ranking members of Oklahoma and Texas Brass had met with Commissioner Larry Scott a handful of times in late 2011 to try and create a possibility to join Colorado in the conference. As smoke began to circle and rumors gave way to facts, the possibilities of OU and Texas being joined by Texas Tech and Oklahoma State to bring the total number of Big 12 defectors to five began to increase. Some sources even noted that A&M could have been swayed away from its inevitable landing spot in the SEC to join them in the pack. The crown jewel of this edition would by far be the University of Texas, which aside from being a major athletic power in 2010, also carried with it a significant amount of academic clout, the factor that no doubt intrigued Pac-10 members. Texas, however, had maintained its own broadcasting network, the Longhorn Network, which was ran by ESPN. If they joined the conference, Pac-16 programming would be run on ESPN's network, which would create some ownership issues with content, but nothing money couldn't fix. A&M and Oklahoma would be no slouch ads either, with Tech and OSU likely joining to help create strength in numbers and stronger regionalism in an eastern branch. Some reporters even believe that Larry Scott was intent on landing popular western rival Notre Dame to the conference as a long-term white whale, but this was never confirmed. Meetings at OU, Oklahoma State, and Texas were announced. Everyone awaited the inevitable. Mac Brown waxed poetic over the death of regionalism. K-State AD John Curry heaped praise on OU in an attempt to sway them back and A&M to the SEC became more and more likely right around the same time Utah to the Pac did. And then, nothing happened. Texas, OU, OSU, and Tech all stayed put. The Big 12 had successfully lobbied to keep them a part of their conference, for now. Big 12 Commissioner Dan Beebe had conceded a new television deal that would continue the usage of unequal revenue sharing that benefited the conference's heavy hitters. Two days after the Big 12 news came out, the Pac-10 invited Utah to become its 12th member, the Utes accepted and joined the conference with Colorado in 2011. With 12 teams instead of 10, the Pac-10 renamed itself the Pac-12 and split itself into two 16 divisions and sports where divisions were necessary. The South comprised the four Mountain Time Zone teams and the Los Angeles schools, while the North comprised the six Pacific Northwest and Bay Area schools. Following the lead of the Longhorn Network, the conference also unveiled the Pac-12 Network in 2012, completely run and distributed by the conference. Following the invitation of Colorado and Utah, the conference experienced a lull period in terms of major events. When college football's championship format extended into a four-team playoff in 2014, Pac-12 champion Oregon earned a spot as a four-seed. Washington entered as a four-seed two years later, but neither team won the national championship. Some baseball teams won national championships, like Arizona in 2012, UCLA in 2013, and Oregon State in 2018. The Pac-12 had dominated softball while the Pac-10, and continued after 2010 with championships by Arizona State in 2011 and UCLA in 2019. Oregon did win back-to-back -back track championships in 2014 and 2015. The push for name, image, and likeness reimbursement came to a head with the Supreme Court rulings in the pandemic, but had been pushed by the court case involving former UCLA basketball athlete Ed O'Bannon. Let's talk about Larry Scott. Scott's inefficiencies as a commissioner became more and more obvious by the day. Economic decisions he had championed, such as relocating the conference headquarters to San Francisco, with a notoriously poor quality, profitability, and reach of the Pac-12 network, had proven to be disastrous for the conference's finances. Time slots that he had signed created a unique but hardly viewed Pac-12 after dark phenomenon. Late night kicks meant that the only eyes on Pac-12 games would be the Pac-12 fans and no one else, because everyone else in the country was already asleep, according to the LA Times' David Wharton. 
While this was a real issue, Wharton also points to the stretch of bad luck that hit the conference, including NCAA sanctions on USC and Chip Kelly's departure for the Eagles of the NFL. Southeastern and Midwestern teams also grew better at attracting and developing players from the West Coast. While football, the moneymaker, burned, Larry Scott championed Olympic sports, which didn't make the conference any money. Wharton's sure to lay this on thick. The Pac-12 lost money while Scott inflated his own salary, and by 2021, the marriage had run its course. Conference leadership announced in early 2021 that they'd be replacing Scott with Klievkov. When the news came out that Oklahoma and Texas had planned on moving from the Big 12 to the SEC, many considered the Pac-12 a convenient landing spot for some of its leftover teams. High-ranking members of the Big 12 thought so as well. The three remaining Texas schools were all confirmed to have at least reached out to the conference, as did Oklahoma State. Many thought that each of the remaining eight Big 12 schools reached out to the Pac-12, but were not selected for expansion. Some rumors appeared online that this was mostly due to members of USC and UCLA not wanting to tie their conference brand into Midwestern teams, though these rumors are mostly heard on message boards like Reddit, so it's unlikely that they were true. Whatever the reasoning is, the Pac stayed at 12. This had proved to be the wrong decision. Not a year later, USC and UCLA both announced their intent to leave the Pac-12 for the Big Ten Conference, joining a mainly Midwestern brand of sports and shocking the college world. This came right as the conference signed their new commissioner, Las Vegas and MGM man George Klievkov. His already difficult task of signing a new television broadcast deal to keep the Pac competitive with the remaining Power Five conferences became Herculean overnight, almost impossible. With the top four group of five brands already added to the Big 12, and few attractive options within the Pac's remaining sphere of influence, the remaining 10 teams returned to the Big 12 for talks of a merger. The Big 12 turned them down. Speculation says that this was likely due to them not wanting all the Big 12 or Pac-12 members, or differences in conference broadcast deals being too difficult to overcome. But whatever the case, it was a problem. With the buffer created by USC and UCLA being members now gone, Klivkoff's task of fixing Scott's issues became more and more impossible. None of this is as apparent as it is with the broadcast rights deal. Many heads in the conference have painted the race to sign a deal as one to compete with the Big 12's broadcast deal. Despite outward confidence from the remaining conference brass, it has become apparent that the Pac-12 has to turn over every rock to find value where they can to compete with the Big 12. Today, the conference has not signed a television deal yet, despite being in talks with multiple networks for over a year. The vultures in the media are certainly circling as well, with many pointing out the talks between the Four Corners schools, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah, and the Big 12 as reason to believe that the conference is dead in the water. Oregon and Washington have also made it clear they'd rather be in the upper echelon of conferences with USC and UCLA. So where does the conference go from here? As a Big 12 fan, I can't help but sympathize with them for the oddly familiar situation they're in, even though a majority of the Big 12 fans feel some kind of adversarial relationship with the pack. Washington State and Oregon State are very similar to K-State, my alma mater, so I know how damaging losing power conference status could be to the cities of Pullman and Corvallis. That being said, adding schools like Arizona or Colorado would certainly elevate the Big 12 in terms of competitiveness, especially in basketball. But I can't help but think the Pac will figure out a way to stay afloat as a power conference. San Diego State being added to retain influence in Southern California is no longer an if, but a when, even if the Aztecs jumped the gun on leaving the Mountain West. While Western schools like Boise State and Colorado State seem to no longer be on the radar, former Southwest Conference threat SMU is, which would give the conference a much-needed visibility boost from the Central Time Zone, despite SMU's rather small fan base as a private school. If the conference can sign a small-term stability deal on par with the Big 12s that keeps Oregon and Washington satisfied enough to stay, then I think they may outlast the Big 12 long enough for another merger to be considered, especially once super conferences of 20-plus schools begin to be created. But things can change quickly in college sports. The Pac-12 itself is proof enough of that. Only time will be able to tell where the historically Pacific conference goes from here.